President. Um, Director General. Director General and Ambassador. That's it. Good afternoon. Before we start the program, may I request you all to kindly switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent mode. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Indian Council of World Affairs, I welcome you all for the 32nd Sub Two House Lecture on the Indo-Pacific from Principles to Partnership. The lecture will be delivered by our esteemed guest, Right Honorable Winston Peters, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, New Zealand, the lecture will be chaired by Ambassador Anil Vadva, Distinguished Fellow, BIF, and former Ambassador of India to uh, Thailand, Oman, Poland, and Lithuania. Allow me to brief you about the program. The program will begin with welcome remarks of DGICWA Ambassador Dr. T. C. A. Raghavan, followed by the opening remarks of the Chair, Dr. Ambassador Anil Vadva, and after which the Honorable Minister will deliver his lecture. Towards the end of the session, a brief question-answer round will be conducted by the chair, who will also give his closing remarks. May I now invite Director General ICWA, Dr. T. C. A. Raghavan, to kindly deliver his welcome remarks. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Winston Peters, Priyanka Radhakrishnan, Member of Parliament, Mr. Mahesh Bindra, former Member of Parliament, Acting High Commissioner, Graham Morton, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the 32nd Sapru House Lecture. May I begin by saying that uh, the timing of a bilateral visit from New Zealand while the Indian cricket team is visiting New, New Zealand uh, is brilliant. Uh, and I can't think of a better note in which uh, to, uh, to time such an important uh, visit. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to welcome uh, all of you here today and to also our many guests, including Mr. Rasgotra, former Foreign Secretary, who is uh, with us. Thank you very much, sir, for your presence. We feel uh, greatly privileged, uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, that you are able to deliver this Sapru House lecture despite the heavy and crowded schedule an important bilateral visit entails. For your background, this council was established in 1943 by a group of intellectuals <coughs> concerned about India's position uh, in the world, and this was some years before we became uh, independent. Even, from, even at that time, our relationship with the Indian and Pacific Oceans has been, in fact, a subject of study and discussion in this institute since its very founding. The theme of your talk today, therefore, is one which interests us greatly both in a contemporary as also in a historical sense. Uh, your presence here, Deputy Prime Minister, is also important to us because of our relations with counterpart institutions in New Zealand, and in particular, the Asia New Zealand Foundation and the New Zealand India Research Institute. With these preliminary remarks, may I now request <coughs> Ambassador Anil Vadwa to deliver his opening comments and also introduce our very, very distinguished uh, speaker. Thank you very much. Director General Raghavan, thank you very much uh, for your opening remarks. Right Honorable Winston Peters, members of Parliament, Acting High Commissioner Graham Morton, Ambassador Skotra, uh, my distinguished colleagues present in the room, uh, distinguished members of the accompanying delegation, ladies and gentlemen, let me um, uh, say a few words about uh, the topic today by way of introduction, um, and I won't be long. Uh, the concept of Indo-Pacific has been around in strategic circles uh, since the new millennium. Indo-Pacific has been debated and used by many countries in the region um, in varying degrees to comprehend the radical changes in international affairs and also to define their respective roles and in national interests. So be it USA's uh, pivot, Asia pivot, Japan's confluence of the two seas and free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, 
Australia's two ocean navy and Indo-Pacific strategic zone of interest, Indonesia's Indo-Pacific Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation, China's Maritime Silk Road, or even India's Act East policy. The Indo-Pacific terminology has entered the international strategic lexicon and is here to stay. It gained massive traction after US President Donald Trump and other senior White House officials used Indo-Pacific as opposed to Asia-Pacific during his first official trip to the region, which happened in November 2018. The emerging economic, energy and security dependencies between the Indian and the Pacific Oceans has been the underlying dynamic to combine the two economic and geopolitically distinct regions into a single supra-strategic region, still defined by the sub-regional security and commercial structures. With increasing globalization, the maritime dimension has gained substantial importance. With more than 90% of international trade by weight and volume, including most of the strategic cargo being carried over the oceans. This has led the Indian Ocean sea, li sea lines of communication to gain tremendous strategic prominence after being considered and as international backwaters for a greater part of the 20th century. India and New Zealand will both like to see the establishment of a rules-based order to secure the global commons of maritime cyber security, etc. <coughs> With the introduction of the Belt and Road Initiative, China is getting more strongly connected to the Indo-Pacific sub-regions such as Southeast Asia, South Asia and now the Pacific Island states. China is also the number one trading partner of more than 120 countries and regions in comparison to the United States which is the largest <coughs> trading partner now for about 75 countries. Along with BRI lending, China's annual imports in merchandise of around $2 trillion create numerous jobs and investment opportunities, propelling economic growth for its trading partners and giving it tremendous bargaining power and leverage in international affairs. Being geographically constrained, access in the Indo-Pacific is feasible only through narrow choke points. And this leads to any traditional or non-traditional threat having a transnational nature. Events in one part of this region inevitably impact another, thereby creating a need for an integrated strategic system. According to a Deloitte study, by 2020, the combined military budgets in the Indo-Pacific will probably exceed 600 billion US dollars and match military spending in North America. Thus, Indo-Pacific is the world's most economically vibrant and security volatile region. There are competing regional economic trading arrangements, the RCEP, the TTP, TPP, the AFTA, and contending connectivity projects, BRI, and now the Blue Dot Initiative, uh, which delay establishing security st strategic structures to manage this region. On the security front, a range of multilateral regional organizations such as IORA, IONS, BIMSTEC, APEC, RECAP, ASEAN, the ARF, ADMM Plus and the East Asia Summit are in place to ensure better governance in the broader Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific region. So now um, the last, I come to the last part and that is about uh, the uh, presence of Australia and New Zealand in a part of the world which is also seeing increasing engagement from other countries in the region. Recently we have seen that Australia, New Zealand and United, United States have increased their aid and engagement with the Pacific Island states. New Zealand has also taken a number of steps in this regard and that includes an additional $500 million and also the purchase of four Boeing P-8A Poseidon aircraft for the region. Uh, before I call upon Right Honorable um, Winston Peters, let me briefly introduce him. <coughs> Mr. Peters grew up in Northland and holds a BA and LLB. 
he entered parliament in 1978 in the seat of Hanua and was MP for Taranga from 1984 till 2005. He formed the New Zealand First Party in 1993. He was Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer from 1996 to 1998. From 2005 to 2008, Mr. Peters was Minister for Foreign Affairs and New Zealand Aid in the New Zealand First Confidence and Supply Arrangement with the Labour government. He is credited with being personally responsible for thawing New Zealand-US relations. He gained a reputation for his tenacious pursuit of fairness and accountability, highlighted by victories in a number of political exposés. Mr. Peters has been successful in two by-elections, when in one in Tauranga in April 1993 and again in Northland in March 2015. As well as being a former primary and secondary school teacher, Mr. Peters has practiced as a barrister and solicitor, including in his own law firm. He is a former New Zealand Maori rugby representative. After the 2017 general elections, New Zealand first formed a coalition government with the Labour Party. Mr. Peters is a Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Foreign Affairs, State-owned enterprises and racing. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great uh, privilege and honour to request now Right Honourable Winston Peters to speak on today's topic on the uh, Indo-Pacific from principles to partnership. You have the floor, sir. Director General, Ambassador, uh, distinguished guests, uh, fellow parliamentarian. Uh, kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Good afternoon and thank you for your invitation to speak here this afternoon. Now, having heard that long introduction, one could be grateful for being in Asia where uh, ageistic behaviour is not uh, to be prejudiced or to reflect on the fact that my colleague Ma Tia has just stood down in Malaysia at 95 years of age and my friend Anwar Ibrahim is, looks like he's going to step up at 72 years of age. But uh, it's a long, long uh, record when you hear it that way. Uh, one is delighted to be here uh, this afternoon and to say to you that uh, because uh, of the uh, particular sporting circumstances, one usually leads less, in the, less introduction because of the millions of cricket fans who have watched your team, cricket team that is, to our country over the past two months. And you will know, as a consequence, how geographically remote we are uh, from your country. But the reality is that our two countries are closer and much more connected than you might think. The frame and character of this address today is the Indo-Pacific uh, from principles to partnerships. Now the most dynamic link between us is in our population. Not the disparity of size, but those of you who have spent the last few days watching the first test from Wellington's Basin Reserve will have seen the thousands and thousands of Indian faces in the crowd and we're not certain whether they were supporting Ajay Patel for New Zealand or Virat Kohli and the visitors from over here. 5% of New Zealand's people now identify as being of Indian origin. That's one in every 20 New Zealanders. And Hindi is our fifth most spoken language. That diaspora has made seriously impressive achievements across all parts of New Zealand society. Indian New Zealanders have made prominent contributions in all fields of endeavour, from business to the judiciary, politics, and through to sport. And dare I say it, in a culinary context, which is often taken for granted, uh, but it's not till you get here and you get the real thing, you realise. However, we're doing the best we can, and we've got enough enthusiastic Indians in New Zealand 
to promote that. Any New Zealanders are represented in our national parliament with three current sitting MPs and a number of others having served at one point in time in nearly every major political party. And two of our Indian origin MPs introduced this afternoon are here as part of this delegation. The most accomplished of Indian New Zealanders include Sir Anand Satnyan, a renowned jurist and former Governor General of New Zealand, who has been honoured formally by the governments of both of our countries, and Dame Suki Turner, and some of you will remember that she's famous in her own right for being the Mayor of Dunedin, one of our biggest cities, but she happened to be married to a New Zealander who wasn't bad on a cricket bat as well, and who's the first foreigner ever to get a thousand runs in the home counties in the UK. So, uh, just to remind you, those of you, those of you who've got a memory about cricket, our common status as democracies is another important connection. India is the world's largest democracy, that's known, and not though often appreciated. Just how difficult that must be to, to be the world's largest democracy. I can tell you, in a population of 5 million people, it ain't easy back home to be part of a democracy. But for the proportionality differential of 1.3 million a billion plus, it must be difficult. But less well known is that New Zealand is amongst the world's oldest with an unbroken democratic record going all the way back to 1854. And the only nine countries in the world can make that claim to have held an unblemished record of elections every term since 1854. We are, we're one of nine in that context. And then, of course, you may well know that the, uh, this country that we're from was the first to give women the vote in 1893. Now, just as Indians rightly feel proud of your historic tryst with, Dennis, with destiny, in 1947, New Zealanders are also very proud of one of our own constitutional firsts, and that is to be to be in the first complete democracy, where everybody over a certain age, but regardless of gender, got the right to vote. Oh, and just in case you didn't know that, they also gave the native people a right to vote as well. Before that, but it was land-based. I happen to be from that native generation. That is, the people that have been there for a thousand years, so to speak. But the point is, when you look back at history and you see all the shortcomings, you can also have a great pride that even though there were those shortcomings, we were the first to find our way out of it to a better future in a more balanced world. Our history and traditions have shaped us both. Legacies of indigenous populations and immigration, now with modern governments leading diverse populations. From our shared Commonwealth heritage, we have inherited an array of familiar parliamentary conventions and traditions. Democracies can be untidy and very unwieldy. Democracy is, as has famously been observed, the worst system of government apart from all the others that have been tried from time to time. At their heart, democracies derive their strength from the sovereignty and consent of the most important person in the world, the individual voter. And no matter how you might feel important as a politician or dare I say a prime minister or minister of finance or a foreign minister, but in the term of that government, for one brief moment in the polling booth on election day, guess who the most important person is? You. And they need, to, they need to constantly be reminded of it. It's a system which for decades has underpinned peace and order in both our countries as well as delivering profound growth and development. With all its failings, there has been spectacular success. Our democratic traditions have also underpinned how we engage with the world. Our systems grounded in the sovereignty and the importance and sanctity of the individual and the rule of law instinctively desire the same things for sovereign nations. And it is precisely for our democratic status and values that we derive our credibility, our trust and influence in world affairs. 
Of course, we have had our differences, which have always been respectfully, if robustly, expressed. It's not a problem to have differences, and sometimes the differences can be both fair and reasonable on both sides. But if we've got respect, we can work our way through them. One thing our foreign policies share in abundance is a stubborn, independent streak. And some of us can remember as young people, far flung away from here, in the other part of the, the other side of the world, knowing of India's independence under former leaders, different leaders, and a different time. But India was renowned for that streak of independence. And we ourselves in the mid-80s also acquired a reputation as well to start to think more independently about our values and how we judged the international scene around us. For both of us, for both of us, this tends to manifest in strong support for international law and the United Nations Charter in the expectation of a voice at decision-making tables relevant to our interests and the support of peace, development and multilateralism which is grounded in respect for the sovereignty of states. Now I know these multi-syllabic uh, words like multilateralism can sound boring after a while, but the reality is our people's interests are based in these concepts. If we've got that, we have a chance of getting a fair go. If we don't, then so many people will drop off the ladder or escalator of progress. The geographical differences between us are immediately evident. Yet with the emergence of the Indo-Pacific as a strategic concept, we find ourselves increasingly linked by what we have in common. We are grateful the Pacific is part of the concept because we're all in this together. At its heart, the Indo-Pacific is maritime and we are both responsible for vast areas of great oceans on which our security and prosperity depend. Where we are is about a quarter of the world's surface if you look at where the, with, of the countries we work with all those Pacific nations, small populations, but they're part of a huge strategic picture and the sooner we get to grasp how important our cooperation in working this out is, then the better. For India, 95% of your trade by volume and well over half your energy is transported via the Indian Ocean. For New Zealand, the Pacific Ocean is likewise vital to our strategic interests and fundamental to our identity. Our great oceans also face similar strategic challenges with growing pressure on multiple fronts. Economic resilience, distance to market and creating employment opportunities remain a real challenge for island states in both oceans. Human development, particularly health and education for remote populations are key areas where government services are often stretched out like a Shanghai. Transnational crime is putting pressure on law enforcement agencies across the region. Climate change continues to have a major impact on our regions as coasts erode, rivers salinate, sea levels rise, and fish stocks decline. In addition, Mr. President, strategic competition is at levels that we have not seen for decades. Mr. Mr. Ambassador, you referred to it in your introductory statements. Like India, New Zealand has direct interests in the Indo Pacific security and we need to wake up the world or our part of the world that these are issues in which our eyes need to be totally wide open. We trade with the world. Our defence interests include our contribution over more than 70 years to the security of the seas and the capacity of all to use those seas. In the Pacific our search and rescue area stretches over one-sixth of the world's surface from the equator to Antarctica. And our various naval deployments in the Gulf of Aden over the past 10 years underline the contribution New Zealand has also made in the Indian Ocean. New Zealand has traveled to every part of the world and we welcome people from all over the world to our country. This brings enormous benefits, but also risks as the ongoing coronavirus outbreak continues to underscore. The terrorist attacks in India and New Zealand in February and March last year, and the Easter terrorist attacks in Sri Lanka were stark reminders that no country is disconnected from poisonous extremist ideologies or their appalling consequences. We are all 
in this boat together. Like India, our massive ocean interests expose us to the most pressing security and development concerns of island countries. Eclipsing all of these is the threat of climate change, which has been identified by Pacific leaders as the number one threat to Pacific peoples. The emergence of the Indo-Pacific terminology recognises these common interests. It unites New Zealand and India in a shared strategic geography as well as a shared commitment to a stable, peaceful, open and secure region. So there you are. Why would you bother the small country of, four, of five million people way out in the Pacific? It's because we all have to be part and parcel of the battle we will comprehensively have to face together. This is reflected in the alignment of our Indo-Pacific policies. Like many in the region, we welcome Prime Minister Modi's remarks to the Shangri-La Dialogue in 2018, where he affirmed India's commitment to, and I quote him, a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific region, one based on the consent of all, not on the power of the few, and characterised by respect for international law, including freedom of navigation and overflight. New Zealand's own Indo-Pacific policies echo and endorse these principles, but they were crafted thinking of the Indian people in mind at that time. Like India, we also want to see an Indo-Pacific that is open and inclusive, that is committed to transparency, that respects sovereignty, that adheres to international law, that upholds freedoms of overflight and navigation, where markets are open, and that is grounded in ASEAN centrality. We also know that safeguarding these principles and responding to the security concerns of our region will require collective action. New Zealand has welcomed ASEAN's release of its Indo-Pacific outlook, which has reaffirmed ASEAN's role as the regional covina at the geographical centre of the region. And we are seeking to reaffirm and reinvigorate our strategic partnership with ASEAN, building on our legacy as its second oldest dialogue partner. We work closely together in ASEAN's architecture especially at the East Asia Summit. India's stated commitment to a proactive and stabilising leadership role in this region is therefore both appropriate and welcome. The visit this week by President Trump has underlined New Delhi's role as a centre of global discussion and active participation in mediating an evolving world order. India's convening power has also demonstrated in the last month with the latest iteration of the Rajna Dialogue, a forum which brings perspectives from the region and indeed the world. New Zealand's perspective is unsurprisingly concentrated in the Pacific, just as the Indian Ocean matters hugely to you who are here in India, the Pacific matters hugely to New Zealand. It is where we wield the most influence and where we can have the most positive impact New Zealand's foreign policy update, our Pacific Reset, has as its long-term goal a stable, prosperous and resilient Pacific. Our policy approach recognises the complexities of the Pacific context, the asymmetrics at play at a time when larger players are renewing their interests, the attendant element of strategic competition and the speed and intensity of the interests at play. Those words and those phrases are a polite way of saying we have got some serious challenges and some of them may be a great danger to all of us. We have operationalised this through significant increases in development assistance, strengthening and broadening our diplomatic footprint, a new defence policy statement, the procurement of new maritime surveillance capabilities to promote regional security while also contributing to reinforcing the international rules-based order. But alongside increasing our investment and ambition, our approach has been grounded in maturing our partnerships with Pacific Island countries to support their independence and sustainable social and economic resilience. We have reset, but there is much more to be done, and so we must look ahead. We need to continue to encourage best practice and the transparency and development cooperation and ensure that the geographical environment does not detract from Pacific priorities 
or risk regional security. We need to keep working on deepening political partnerships across the region and with our partners, other partners at that, often look to us for insight, collaboration and cooperation on engaging in the Pacific context. Above all, we need to put our principles into action, maintaining the ethos of partnership and respect that has underpinned New Zealand's engagement to date. We encourage others to listen and respond to the priorities of Pacific partners when engaging in the Pacific. And we are committed to showing the same respect for other partners, sovereignty and priorities when we engage with them in other parts of Indo-Pacific. We know India seeks to take a similar approach. And that's where the Indo-Pacific concept joins us up together. In that context, New Zealand welcomes India's commitment to the Pacific Islands region. And we recognize India's long-standing cultural, historical and human ties across the region and its contribution to Pacific security priorities. This includes India's signing on to the Paris Agreement and its determination to increase investment in renewable energy and solar power generated in the Pacific, as reflected in Prime Minister Modi's undertakings to Pacific leaders. That contribution undermines the leadership role India can play across the region. New Zealand wants to see India take a greater role in international political structures that support global security and regional economic governance. New Zealand has supported India's bid for a permanent seat in a restructured UN Security Council. But we also see commensurate leadership responsibility in respect of global economic governance. Threats to the rules-based multilateral trading system should concern us all. New Zealand has been active in supporting WTO reform efforts, but we need all countries to engage in these to preserve in the stability and predictability that's been critical to our shared economic prosperity and security. And we need to tell our wider population that though they might be busy, this, these developing rules will affect their lives every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every year, that they're alive. So they should take some serious interest to make sure they suit them as well. We ought therefore also strongly encourage India to become a full participant in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, commonly known as RCEP. New Zealand respects India's wish to seriously consider the terms of its engagement, but the blunt reality is that India's absence from the region's economic architecture is in neither of our economic nor our strategic interests. We want India to be a foundation member of a rules-based grouping committed to regional trade and development. And if India wishes to be a key player in the region, securing an enduring and influential voice in the region's economic and trade architecture, we believe it will be essential. Membership, that is, of something like RCEP, if not RCEP. Building on our shared interests is already showing promise. In addition to the alignment of our Indo-Pacific policies, our visit here will support a number of practical outcomes. This includes an air service agreement, enhanced custom cooperation, a commitment to greater collaboration in multilateral forums, such as the UN Security Council and various business deals underlying the economic connectivity between our countries. We can and should be doing a whole lot more business together. And just in case you take a look and think those guys are all farmers, well, they're not. We've got a whole lot of people doing manufacturing, IT, uh, sending rockets now uh, up into the sky, one of the biggest new inventions we've got. There's a lot going on in New Zealand. You're a great agricultural country as well, but the way the world's going is we could cooperate on the agricultural sector at no cost at all to any farmer in India. It's the ability to work together, to market together for the markets that's growing to service, that we need a service from both of our countries. Can I just say that there is more we can do in the wider relationship that's why, as part of our visit here, we are launching a refreshed New Zealand-India strategy for investing in the relationship. As our remarks today have underlined, we have an excellent foundation on which to build. The strategic reality of our shared Indo-Pacific region 
reinforces that New Zealand and India are closer than we might think and that we are embarked on a shared journey. Now just one thing for some of us here, and it's simply this. Times of the essence. If we waste time, vacuums will be filled by others, neither in the interest of India, or dare I say it, the Indo-Pacific region and the people of New Zealand. So let's start working together. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, some time now, which has been set aside for questions and answers. And um, we actually have 10 minutes more uh, than envisaged. So, I think we can have more questions during this period. So, wish. Uh, I'd like to now open the floor for questions so that uh, the Deputy Prime Minister can answer them. Uh, I'd request you to please identify yourselves, keep the question uh, to the point in short, and uh, not uh, make too many long comments, if you might. So please uh, feel free to ask questions. Dilip, please. Uh, Dilip Sina, former ambassador. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your uh, extremely uh, enlightening talk and for your uh, appeal for cooperation between India and New Zealand. My question uh, to you is uh, that South China Sea is an important part of this Indo-Pacific region and there are conflicting claims in, this, uh, in these waters. What is New Zealand's position on how these matters should be resolved? Uh, thank you for your question. The reality is that there has been an international jurisprudential decision on that and it should be observed. Is that, is that, that's clear enough, right? Yeah, yeah okay. okay. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Excellency. Uh, my name is Deepa Kurora. I'm diplomatic editor with the Tribune Online. Uh, uh, President Trump mentioned about, during his visit to Delhi, about quiet, reviving quiet, you know. How do you think you can be part of it or you can fit into it? Actually, I'm going to ask somebody in my staff to get up and answer that question. Uh, he's talking about the, the comments on Quad. Uh, yes, please, yes. This is our director. Can you tell them the full, your full title? Yeah, Andrew Needs. Uh, Andrew Needs, head of um, South and Southeast Asia Division in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, so we're talking about uh, India, Australia, Japan, and the Indeed. US. Yep, OK. Well. Um, they're uh, big players with big interests in, the, in this part of the region. Um, and lots of uh, countries at various times coalesce around areas of interest and talk to each other. Uh, what these evolve into over time, is, it's always hard to tell. And, and some start and then dissipate over time. So it's something that's happening. It's something that we're interested in watching. Um, but as the minister points out, you know, we have a huge interest in what's going on in the Indo-Pacific. In fact, I think one of your senior um, foreign affairs people recently talked to us when we last had foreign policy consultation, talked about the Indo-Pacific, India and New Zealand being uh, bookends of the Indo-Pacific. It's a slightly lopsided set of bookends, and sort of like an elephant at one end and a kiwi at the other. Um, but we follow those things with interest, but we don't have a huge amount of um, sort of national cut through on those things because they are great powers or significant middle powers that are involved um, in those processes, but we do follow them very closely. Swish. Sometimes it's, we can't always comment on what Mr. Trump says, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, my question really is, uh, what connects, in terms of security, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean? As you said, that your interests are really in the Pacific. How does that security interest connect with the concerns in the Indian Ocean? I, sub 
uh, I don't know whether uh, my question is clear or not. No, it's very clear. It's very clear, sir, and I could have outlined the fact that uh, uh, we've been in Afghanistan for a long, long time. We've been in Iraq for a long, long time working with the Australians in training the troops. But we also put military aircraft into the, into surveillance of North Korea to ensure that the nuclear prohibition is maintained. So that's how far it stretches, and I think that is the answer to your link on the Indo-Pacific security question. And a fascinating question, the first question was asked, uh, was about the ownership of the Spratly Islands, in, this, in essence, and whether or not being international believes in international uh, rule of law we would support what the international uh, uh, judgment on that matter is. And my country does. So that's our connected interest. That's how close to home it is to India. Thank you, yes, sir. Over there. Excellency, we people globally are facing terrorism. Uh, could you just identify yeah, yourself first? Today, Sorry, yourself. please identify. Today, I am a consultant at Original Science and Technology. Thank you. So, we people are facing globally a terrorism very seriously. And USA had also experience of 9-11. So, everywhere something is happening because of terrorists. So, do you have any policy which can be a common interest from India to deal with this type of situation? Sir, I think uh, governments all around the world are wrestling with the problem of terrorism. And whilst we can put all the legal uh, restraints and the, the, the protections and defences in, the problem that we're being confronted with is the, uh, un, the unknown under the radar character that no one is watching carefully enough and where we have insufficient intelligence on who that person might be. Now, as a uh, part answer to that question is, the more international cooperation that might happen, the better our chances are of identifying such a clear and present future danger. But in our case, July last, in May the 15th last year, someone came from offshore and murdered 51 people and North did enormous damage to another 50 or, or like that. And then hundreds were also affected by it as well. And we are engaged in a full-scale commission of inquiry trying to find out how did this happen? But to the best of our knowledge, no one at this point in time in Australia knew, nor did anybody in his village or his family. But the point is, there were signs, and uh, all of us need to, as, go as governments, are going to have to put more resources in, and shared resources at that, to better identify the kind of character that, we're, uh, that is capable of being a terrorist at any given time. Uh, None of us are expert in it, but we will do better if our international engagement is joined up to ensure we've got the best intelligence possible. But that's what we're all wrestling with now. Okay. Um, gentlemen over there, please. My name is B.C. Sony Mountaineer, and I'm Secretary at Axe. India and New Zealand have the old partnership regarding mountaineering, Edmund Hillary and Norgit Tensi. Now in India, first time we start river rafting, also by the Edmund Hillary. So, so that I request you, sir, what is your program regarding youth exchange program? Because of that, in India, have the 70% population is called youth. So they like adventure sports and a, a youth exchange program with New Zealand. So, what is your opinion? Yes. Sorry. Okay. He was asking about yes. Uh, yes. High Commissioner. Yes. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your question uh, for, and saying you're a mountaineer. I wonder whether you can remember the words of the song that they built around Edmund Hillary when he climbed Mount Everest all those years ago. Now, you could be forgiven not knowing because you wouldn't have been alive, but I was. <laughs> it's a lovely little four, four line ditty. But on uh, uh, youth, uh, youth action programs, you mean all sorts of adventure and outdoor programs? Uh, we have brought a person on our uh, business group with us who does exactly that sort of thing. They're working in Nepal at, the, at this present time, but also doing work in New Zealand and elsewhere 
where you're taking the natural uh, topography of a country and opportunity and turning it into something thrilling for tourists and trampers and explorers to uh, in, engage in, in a business context. But uh, I have to tell you, in the big picture of youth action programs, I'm not quite the right minister. Foreign affairs is my specialty. But back home, and what we do back home, I would better send you to the Minister of, of Sport or the Minister of Tourism on that score. But, uh, but other than to say that tourism is a big, and outdoor tourism is a big part of our economy. And uh, clearly, if, it were, if we could share ideas that you might have, we'd be pleased to hear them. Uh, yes, at the back there, no, Akhilesh. Sir, I am Akhilesh Suman from Rajya Sabha Television. In a while you are going to meet uh, External Affairs Minister. Are you going to raise the issue of RCEP because India did not join? Do you uh, consider India logic or are you going to give any fresh logic so that India can be interested in RCEP? It's a very good question, sir. I can say that, um, of course, we'd like India to be part of it, to be a critical part of it, for a whole lot of reasons that are that uh, this is soon to be the biggest population country in the world. It is massively the greatest and biggest democracy in the world. It has first world jurisprudential and shared values that that we have all signed up to as well, and there's so much in common. Um, but in persuading local politicians from your Prime Minister downwards, we have to make our case out. We've got to convince the local constituency that this is in their national interest. Now look, not all trade deals have been good. Some have not been uh, favourable to certain populations. Uh, the best trade deals is where all populations all countries have their uh, people's economy and wealth and employment opportunities and a host of other things lifted all at the same time. So uh, you'll hear a whole lot of comment on RCEP, but, but my personal opinion is we need to, confess, uh, to convince the political uh, the leaders of, of India and also the constituency. But that said, I've no doubt that it's in the best interests uh, of the uh, of the people of India, and the reason I say that is because India has got the skills and the talent and the organisation, and has proven it with its current growth rate to match any challenge it might face, and it must enter this arrangement with that level of confidence. Thank you. Yes. Sir. Good afternoon, I'm Prasad uh, from the Tribune newspaper. Uh, you made a statement uh, in the lecture saying that the agriculture sector of cooperation could be good because the farmers will not be affected. But one of the reasons for pulling out of RCEP was the dairy industry. And that's where some of the issues are connected to that part of the world from which you come from. So where do you find a reconciliation? It's because the Indian people have capacity for so much more consumption of dairy products. And we want to help you to market them. We want you to take this great product and sell it to a wider band of uh, consumers in India that you can't at the moment supply. So we can all do business together in the interest and at, and, and at a better price uh, to your domestic market. And I don't think it's too difficult to prove that in terms of demand and, and potential supply. Otherwise, we wouldn't come and say it to you. We're not so arrogant to come from five million people, try and talk to your country, been around for cent for, for millennium, and and pull a wool over your eyes, so to speak. In this case, dairy products. But we're saying, working together, I bet we can show you with added value that we're all going to do a whole lot better off, and the Indian farmer would have nothing to worry about. Otherwise, if we can't convince you of that, why would a local farmer go with the deal? Give us a chance to convince them. That's all we're asking. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Gentlemen there at the back, you are. Uh, I'm Ravi Bhatia, retired from Delhi University. Uh, Your Excellency, you uh, talked about sea level waters rising. 
and that is posing a big challenge not only to your country, it's a small country, but to many other parts of the uh, world, including parts of India. My question is, how are you dealing with this challenge? Uh, if you could explain it a little bit. Uh, thank you very much, sir. That's a seriously good question because uh, you will have uh, observed that our nearest neighbour, Australia, has a different approach or that all the Pacific Island countries are looking to us and other countries to step up here because they have a clear and present danger of rising sea levels. And uh, it's not just the question of rising sea levels, which a lot of people contest, but it's the nature of the climate change at, where, at what level the sea gets to in, an, in a uh, climatic disaster that has hitherto not been experienced in, our, in, in, in recent history. That's what our, where our worry is. What are we doing about it? Well, we've got a zero carbon by 2050 policy. Uh, we have a policy of persuading by incentivised assistance the farming community of New Zealand to be part and parcel of this change. We are convinced that with new science, proper assistance, we can get there and, add, and we've got a whole range of initiatives to do that. For example, we're planting a billion trees. Now, a billion trees uh, over 10 years is a, a major, major project, but we're doing that. And as we build, uh, there are all sorts of other op opportunities which we, we can take. But the recycling of rubbish and turning it to energy is probably the next great place we'll go. And then there are all the new, new initiatives dependent on modern science, like hydrogen and all the new technologies that are coming in that area. We uh, are a country that has made it very clear uh, as a, a government that we believe we can get on top of this thing and that we should, when we talk to other countries, uh, be an example of what can be done. Uh, it's a very exciting uh, time at, at this, uh, in politics now, but there's also that n dreadful cynicism that says you can do nothing. And you might have observed that the Australians just came out of probably the worst bushfires they've had since 1930, 1932 to massive floods the next week. An appalling contrast. And um, we are looking, in, looking at that very carefully because there are aspects to climate change which we believe underscore the integrity of the argument. New Zealand does not have a lot of political cynics on the issue of whether we should do something or not. Good. Hello, I'm Asha Sundarmurthy. I'm pursuing a PhD on regional stability in the Indo-Pacific. So um, my question is, so you spoke of India um, trying to occupy, I mean, warning against the vacuum that might develop in the Indo-Pacific if we stay out of things for too long. So my question is regarding the Pacific Island states. Uh, would New, Ze New Zealand like to see more of an engagement than we already have done in the region? We would certainly like to see a greater engagement by India in the region, most definitely. And we offer to do our best to facilitate that in the same way as we are doing our best to facilitate the uh, awakened engagement of Indonesia in our part of the world as well. And when I talk about a vacuum uh, developing, uh, no, the vacuum's there now. And we can't wait around too long uh, while adverse, diametrically opposed views and uh, beliefs prevail. So uh, one of the reasons that I'm we came here, amongst other things, is to emphasize to Prime Minister Modi and his team that their recent Pacific step up and engagement with Pacific Island leadership is a very sound thing to promote. And if we can help working alongside India on that, we would like to. Now, what's, our, what, what's your reason for taking that seriously? Well, I'm here to tell you that nobody understands the Pacific better than us. All right? You might hear a lot of others talk about it, but we have spent decades, much longer, respecting their culture, understanding their background, being DNA connected, 
and uh, and we have in our cabinet today uh, about 44 uh, percent from Pacific Island extraction. Now that's almost an all-comers record if you look at the ethnic breakup of New Zealand. And then we have, uh, in terms of the local Maori population, that's about, depending on the level of, uh, how shall I say it, identity of Maori they might be, it may be 10%, it's probably around between 8 and 10, depending on, on what you argue. Uh, but in a parliament of 120, there would be 32 have a who have a Maori ethnic background or connection. Uh, so we've done a, a dramatic lot in that area, and when we talk to countries like India and elsewhere about, please, please talk to us. It's not because we want to poke our nose into your foreign policy, but because we want to see that whatever money you might spend has a chance of being more successful in our collective interests in the Pacific. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, Ian. Yes. I'm Brabjeet, uh, I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, my question is regarding the immigration. A uh, lot many people, especially in the north in Punjab, they are making good businesses in sending the youth outside. So I have two specific questions. How has been your experience uh, in immigration of the youth of India settling for greener pastures in your country? Second is, how much more can the New Zealand absorb? <laughs> yeah. yeah, what is the scope in the coming one decade, the next decade? They are looking for a better life there. Better. Um, so I can, re I can recall a long time ago when a president in the United States called Jimmy Carter was telling the uh, and criticizing the Chinese president for his country not allowing Chinese people to leave China. And the Chinese president said to him, Mr. President, how many do you want? <laughs> 25 million? 50 million? Or 100 million? He never got another question from Jimmy Carter after that. <laughs> now, your question, uh, Ben Sandley, we have two MPs from the Punjabi in our parliament, don't we? We have two. So that's number one. Uh, and that's a significant high proportion given the proportionality of India. On the other question, uh, well, we're coming to an election in seven months' time, and it's a fascinating question because I have here with a leading member of another political party who's also come who's from Indian background. But my answer to you is that's a question we have to answer. I'm giving my personal answer now with a soundly thought-out population policy because in the end, our, the wisdom of our immigration policy will be to be bring people in who can be positioned in our economy, particularly in our provincial economy. Because what's have been happening is they're all heading for the big cities. And the, the house price is going through the roof, homelessness is getting worse, affordability is getting worse. Meanwhile, out in the countryside, we can't get workers. So we need to refocus that so that the provinces have a, 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 a key part of our future population policy. But we have not as a country, actually to tell you the truth, sat down for five decades and thought about the very answer to your question. How many people should we have? If you want to make a contribution to that, drop me a line. That was a question. Yeah, yeah. I know it's a question. I think we should ask the people of my country that. It depends on the requirement and demand. demand. Yeah, but, you, but you, I, I know what you're saying. But the, the key thing is, if you're, offer, if you're offering people what in effect is the promised land, you better make sure they get the promised land and they're not cheated out of their hopes and aspirations. So when they get there, they've come too far and they can't do a thing, can't go back. They've made a total disconnect from their past and what we promised them is not delivered. When we ask people to come to our country, to immigrate to our country, we should have a backup policy to ensure that was, what was in the promise is in fact delivered then we can be proud of what we're doing here. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, Honorable Deputy Prime Minister, for your address. My name is Anushka Saxena. I'm a student. Uh, keeping in mind the centrality of the ASEAN in the Indian Ocean region, what steps has New Zealand taken, uh, aside from its dialogue partnership, to act, create a strategic partnership with the ASEAN bloc in the region? 
When they ask us for money, we give it. <laughs> That's a fact. We think that ASEAN is a critical feature of the, uh, of the narrative uh, and of the, the structure. And we uh, therefore agree with India uh, about the need to be, ensure where our heart and core and our focus is. And what have we done? Well, we've been a long-term, second longest-term dialogue partner. <coughs> and the Prime Minister is going there shortly to respond to her financial requests. And because of the juxtaposition of circumstances, the Minister of Finance in New Zealand won't be able to refuse. Yes. <coughs> Mr Needs. Minister, you put me on the spot before. I'm going to put myself on the spot on that one. Just to add to those things that you said about the, the importance that we place on the role of ASEAN, we call it our <coughs> centrality, um, and our relationship with ASEAN. The Minister said you know, how much we've invested in it. Um, you know, we have a large uh, ODA program which we uh, channel to the least developed countries within the ASEAN network. Uh, our Prime Minister will be in Vietnam for uh, a suite of meetings in April and uh, we'll be having a special summit with um, ASEAN leaders to talk about the relationship between us and ASEAN, which I think is at the 45th anniversary, I think that's right. Um, and we have a renewed plan of action with how, how we are going to engage, which is all about, um, you know, ASEAN has been an incredibly successful uh, body, those, those countries themselves still have a strong focus on their national identity but they see themselves as part of that region and it's been, that body has been uh, key to ensuring uh, peace and dialogue within that region which has meant economic progress has been so profound in, those, in that area and we want that to continue and we want to be a part of that. So we are not members of ASEAN but we are very active participants in the, the suite of uh, activities <coughs> in which ASEAN is involved. Okay. Yes, sir. <coughs> Thank you. It's, uh, Dr. Asmir, I am Professor of Economics. I was uh, going with a uh, very wonderful speech, but I just wanted to know what is the stand of New Zealand on this free trade agreement, because it's a very vast region, in that being such a big country. So the negotiation which is going on, that is extremely important for part of the foreign policy, for surviving any organization. So I just like to know about this stand of uh, this uh, New Zealand and free trade agreement between among the regions, different countries. What is the status now? Which one are you referring to? Free trade India, agreement. In, in India, New Zealand? In, in the, no, not Indo-Pacific. Within the region like uh, European Union, they have got a sub agreement. It's a huge region. So what India can do something then and what is the stand of New Zealand and Australia? That is extreme. That is dominated uh, by so, these yeah, two countries. I I was mishearing you. you. You're saying, what's the stand of New Zealand? And I thought you, sh you meant the standoff. <laughs> Sorry, and I think, there's no standoff. We spent all our time trying to get these arrangements, RCEP going. I mean, we put a lot of effort into fixing up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, its defects, and in the late 2017, put it back together again with like-minded countries, including reinvigorating Japan into the finality of getting it signed out now and it's up and running to the enormous benefit of all of us. Uh, on RCEP, well, we spend all our time trying to encourage India to look with new eyes or, how shall I say it, to fi refine our arguments so that they are compelled, or the arguments are so compelling, countries will sign up. Now, in my long career, I've seen trade deals which have not been explained properly. And so our job is to explain it and go out to all its constituency members. And the composition that puts uh, a, 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 a constituency MP or minister says if I do that I'm going to lose my seat. Our job is to ensure that his seat doesn't think that way. So it's a lot of hard work, it's an enormous grind and, and uh, foreign affairs and trade in my country and others slog it out 24-7 just trying to get common sense uh, understood. Um, if you think that we are in any way less enthusiastic about it, uh, no, I think you're wrong. Other than there has a, there's a new bent, or a new twist, or a new focus. We want free trade to be fair. Fair trade for everybody. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Pragya Pandey, and I'm a research fellow here at the Council. So 
So my question is regarding the role of China. Like, how do you see the role of China in the larger South Pacific region? Given that you know, in the past few years there has been substantial increase in Chinese aid as well as in the investment in the some of the Pacific island countries. So how does New Zealand look at the uh, future, uh, you know, role of China in the region? South Pacific. Um, I thought you might ask that question when I came here today. The answer to it is that uh, we have tried to work with China cooperate with China uh, on programs and policies which do not compromise our values and our principles and our beliefs and above all the belief in democracy and freedom and the rule of law uh, and I suppose in countless areas we've uh, sought to work with them in, in theatres uh, but where things are not what we believe they should be we have said so, up front, out front, uh, rather than to, to go behind a country's back. In short, um, you know, we've had a quite a significant long history with China in recent times that predates that of other countries in the sense of the, uh, the free trade agreement is the first one they had. And although it wasn't the best free trade agreement we could have got, it was rather exceptionally better than a lot of people thought we could get. Um, others came along later and got a better deal, but don't forget it was the opening deal. And also it is a, a standard of a deal below which we will never go in the future. So we want something better than wherever we be, we might be uh, as we go forward. Um, China is a country that is, uh, as you know, uh, has got a significant aid program, which is more a grant program with low interest rates. And uh, there are countries in the Pacific and elsewhere that are borrowing money uh, and in our view, in circumstances where they have no capacity to pay it back. And that also begs the question, well, what happens then? And uh, that was what other countries fear as well. So we're engaged in the Pacific with Australia, with the EU, with a whole lot of other countries where our foreign aid is foreign aid. It does not come with strings and it comes with uh, you know, the uh, requirement that uh, the principles of uh, non-corruption by politicians is paramount. Now, I won't point a finger here, but we are looking at countless circumstances where the circumstances are really the converse of that, which they are not above board. Politicians are being bought off, and uh, the level of accountability is quite frightening. So, uh, how shall I say it? We have more chance of persuading other countries and other contributors in the Pacific to the correctness and the wisdom of proper behaviour if other influences are in there to counterbalance the overwhelming, the overwhelming influence they might have. And it's not easy. It's extraordinarily difficult. Especially when we know in parts of Asia, and dare I say it, in parts of Polynesia where I come from, there's an old saying, if you can't help your own, who can you help? Well, that's a cigarette paper between that and corruption. And our job, our job is to yeah, help you earn, but not at the cost of your outsiders, not at the cost of uh, other aspects of your population. So it is enormously, it is enormously, enormously difficult to prosecute this job and, and uh, engage in overseas aid and, and, and ensure that things are above board. But I can say that we were recently adjudged to be the least corrupt country in the world. Now, given some of the politicians I know back home, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> that's just a joke, by the way. I don't even tell them to start telling them publicly. Your Excellency, welcome to India. Uh, my name is Nivedita Mukherjee, and I write for the Diplomatist magazine. Uh, you know, it's pretty obvious that the WTO is kind of in a state of almost in a state of extinction. Uh, do you think there is scope for uh, you know, building a new architecture for free fair trade? Or do you think the way now is multilateral regional agreements and you know, FTAs? And secondly, what is your stand on India's uh, you know, uh, getting a seat in the UN Security Council? Well, start with the last question. We have undertaken to support uh, India's nomination for a reconfigured Security Council in 2021-22, beginning 2022 it is, 
So we, that's the answer to that question. Uh, I can tell you, you threw me off when you asked me the last question because it was part of my speech. But never mind. What was your first question? WTO. Uh, WTO. Oh, WTO. Oh, sorry. Well, we are, my country is doing all it can to support the WTO. Now, you can say, well, that's gone. Let's, got a, let's start a new institution. But everybody here who knows business will know, or, or economics will know, it's far easier to keep an existing business go, going, and it's far more reasonable cost to keep an existing business going than to start a new one. And I believe the WTO, though it's not a business, is the same. We should do our utmost to, uh, to give it new meaning and uh, a new importance because it's the present victim of, a, of trade battles and you know where they're coming from. Sad to say. But that will not always prevail. Sooner or later, they're going to want an international order or, or, or like the WTO to support the WTO has been good for small countries like ours, and the mass majority of countries in this world are small. They need all to be backing it to the hilt. And we're not, as a, as a country, not giving up. Uh, we are, I suppose, subtly pointing the finger as, as, to, as to what's going on here. But we all know how it happened and why it's happened. And it's not the fault of the WTO. Thank you. Uh, Gentlemen over there, uh, the cap. Yes. Uh, good evening, Excellency. My name is Kanesh Gupta, and I'm a blogger with. Uh, I run my own blog called Aggressor Bharat on governance, economy, and security. <laughs> Sir, last August. Uh, India's, uh, some of India's naval, naval ships visited Australia and, US and Australia and New Zealand. So our chief of naval staff also mentioned that he would like to have greater cooperation with New Zealand and Australia. What kind of role do you see India pl playing in the Pacific area? Because India is quite active in the, Indo in the Indian Ocean right now. Um, so I'm not qualified to say what, what role I see India playing, but whatever role it is playing, we would like to be cooperating with them uh, in our part of the world, or indeed in the wider in the wider circumstance. I mean, we have been helping out in having a, having our maritime assets committed out of uh, out of Aden, which is our greatest far reach from where we are, and that's awful. A lot closer to you than it is to us. So I would like to get up and tell you what I think the Indian military or this Navy should be doing, other than to say that we uh, are in dialogue. My Minister of Defence is in serious dialogue with your Minister of Defence. We have um, uh, very important meetings on what we both think about what we should do. You're a much bigger country, obviously, but it all helps. And in our part of the world, surveillance, maritime movements, all the way down to the plain old uh, customs security where drugs are concerned, is important. So it's a hugely interconnected, not just defence uh, issue that we're talking about, it's the total picture. Um, at this point in time, of course, we are very, very pleased that India is building a bigger maritime and military capacity and it's not because we're not, we don't want a peaceful world, but frankly, uh, we think that the sense of safety and security for other nations surrounding us will be better assured if that happens as against leaving it all to some other country to do the work. I think we'll have to bring this uh, session to a close. Uh, yes, please, do you have a question? Okay. I don't have a question. <laughs> um, I was about to jump in and ask you, we, we, we were running a short of time. Um, just in relation to the, the last question that the, the Minister answered, just to buttress that point, um, you know, defence relationships come out of a wider set of relationships, and the Minister has said earlier in his speech that um, you know, we're encouraging India to take a more proactive uh, role in engaging with the Pacific. So that question comes, it's not the first thing you do, 
um, when you're engaging with other nations. Um, it's something that comes later on. The other point there is that um, our own military, which is um, modest, in keeping with a country of less than five million, really does predominantly focus on our more immediate strategic area, which is in the Pacific. But as the Minister said, we, we, we also um, make contributions in the multilateral area a lot further from home. Um, but of also this is where Australia comes into it because it has a much bigger military. And that is the only formal defence relationship we have, uh, which is called Closer Defence Relations to so Australia and New Zealand. We're very close in that area. Minister, can I, will you indulge me just yeah. to say a couple of things? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say in relation, you know, the whole theme of this um, discussion really has been um, around the Indo-Pacific and I'm going to just encourage you to go back to the speech because my team in, con in consultation with the Minister wrote that speech and I think most of the questions that came up there uh, really were answered or the, the impossible to answer questions, he rephrased the question because we still have to think about that. So I'd like to encourage you to go back to the speech and read it in more detail. But also, the Minister mentioned that we have launched a, a renewed strategy for our relationship, and it's called India-New Zealand 2025, Investing in the Relationship. We've made it suitably modest, once again, in keeping with New Zealand being a modest nation, but it has six sort of pillars or themes in there, um, and it will provide the framework, if you're rereading re the Minister's speech, to think some of that through. It's, it's designed for a very diverse audience, not necessarily as sophisticated as the one here, but I hope you'll find it, uh, find it useful. Just one final point in relation to the evolution of our thinking with regard to the Indo-Pacific. Um, you know, we were a colony of the UK, and for many, and as the Minister said in his speech uh, before, for many years it was all of our goods went there. We didn't have a services industry, we just sold primary products, and if they went to war, we went to war on their side, and things have evolved a lot since then. Um, we defined ourselves as, as a Pacific nation, um, and then we defined ourselves as an Asia-Pacific nation, and we're increasingly seeing that the Indo-Pacific as um, you know, great powers uh, sort of um, defining a lot of the conversation in this part of the world. Um, the Indo-Pacific is becoming an increasingly useful concept for us too. Um, you know, we had a debate, in, in, you know, certainly within the foreign ministry and with the minister about are we an Asia-Pacific nation? Are we, uh, you know, where does Indo-Pacific fit in that? And we're comfortable with both, but we see the, the concept of the Indo-Pacific becoming an increasingly big construct for us. But I, you know, personally, also, I also see it dominating global discussions in time to come. Yes. <coughs> Thank you very much. I hope uh, some copies of that would be available uh, for uh, the audience to take away. Can I just Thank say you. one thing? Uh, can I say one thing before we go? It's been a delight and pleasure and thank you very much for asking us along uh, this afternoon. Uh, you often look at audiences and you think, what are they thinking of you, so to speak? And we look at that conceptually because it's been our view that a whole lot of countries have looked at, our, have looked at New Zealand over the years and mischaracterised and misconceived who we are. We're a country with a very diverse background that respects uh, a lot of values not respected by some countries. We've had three women prime ministers. The current prime minister is a woman. The head of the jurisprudential system of our country is a woman. The head of treasury is a woman. Uh, we've got about four, five, and um, uh, we don't have a problem with that. Uh, but we're a country with a different background, and we want these people to see the modern New Zealand as we are today. You know, we've all been, uh, some of us anyway, uh, um, results of colonialism, early settlement, and um, what your experience might be here, as opposed to ours, is not unique. We've all been through the mill, so to speak, but we've got ourselves out of there, and we hope to do much, much better in the future. Nobody's perfect. I'm half Maori and half Scots. The Maori is native New Zealander, right? It is said that that gives you the best of both worlds, all right? A natural suntan and a desire to save money. Or the converse, being half Maori, half Scots. One half you want to have a drink, the other half doesn't want to pay for it. <laughs> no, we're not too different, okay? Thank you very much. So I'd like to, uh, on behalf of this um, very uh, knowledgeable audience, uh, thank Right Honourable Winston Peters 
for his uh, uh, for his comprehensive speech and also for answering a whole range of questions which were thrown at him uh, during that those 40 minutes that we had at our disposal. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to summarize what went on, uh, but just to thank the minister for his presence here today at ICWA and uh, also uh, to tell him how much we all benefit benefited by his presence. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. On behalf of the Indian Council of World Affairs, I'd like to. Uh, on behalf of the ICW, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Minister, uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, for delivering a fascinating lecture, and I'd also like to thank um, Ambassador Anil Badwa for chairing the session. Now, I request DG ICWA to present uh, select publications of ICWA to the Deputy Prime Minister. Recent books and journals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for the patience with which you answer <laughs> so many questions. Uh, thank you. Yeah, great. All right. Thank you. I request the New Zealand delegation for to assemble for a group photo near the foyer. And I invite you all to join us for Haiti at the forest. Please take a photograph. Okay.